Mark, the now more than one million's live lost to COVID-19, we're getting a clearer picture of how doctors and scientists gave us our best weapon against the virus, the COVID vaccine. Now, researchers from the Commonwealth Fund estimate that the U.S. COVID-19 vaccine program has prevented as many as 2.2 million deaths. The Kaiser Family Foundation analysis also shows that since June of last year, at least 234,000 deaths could have been prevented had those patients been vaccinated. Let's bring in Dr. Paul Offit, the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, for more on this. Dr. Offit, thank you for being here. I know you helped develop a rotavirus vaccine and you were involved in the authorization process for the COVID-19 vaccine. So given vaccine hesitancy in this country right now, can you walk us through how intensive that development and authorization process is for vaccines? Sure. Well, this this is um, the fastest vaccine ever made. That's certainly true. We we isolated and sequenced that virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, in January of 2020. And 11 months later, we had two large-scale clinical trials, Pfizer and Moderna, of 40,000 and 30,000 people showing the vaccine worked and was safe. I mean, it's hard to make a vaccine much faster than that. And the reason was one thing, money. Uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed, which put $11 billion into that program, essentially took the risk out of it for pharmaceuticals. Companies. So normally you do sort of phase one trials, you know, sort of dosing, dose ranging trials, then phase two trials where you look at hundreds of people, then phase three trials, which is tens of thousands of people, then you manufacture, then you, you build the manufacturing plant, then you submit it for, for licensure. Those sort of, sort of were, were all compressed. I mean, the good news is, you know, safety guidelines were still followed and nothing, you know, was truncated or ignored. It was just a compressed process because you took the, the, uh, the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. But I think that, that people looking at that would, would assume wrongly that that meant that we had skipped critical steps or safety guidelines, and that didn't happen. Now, the FDA recently announced it's limiting the authorized use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine after an investigation into reports of rare blood clots. Should those risks have been identified earlier in the authorization process, and do you worry about the impact on the public's confidence in vaccines? Well, so this is a very rare risk, the blood clots associated with Johnson & Johnson vaccine, also seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine in the United Kingdom. Um, but it's so rare. It's not the kind of thing that's going to be seen sort of before authorization or before licensure. It's the kind of thing that's only going to be seen, problem that's only going to be seen when the vaccine is in millions of people, not in tens of thousands. So I don't think there was anything there really pre-approval that said this was going to be a problem. This is true of, frankly, any medical innovation in the history of humankind, invariably there's a human price to pay. You always would like to believe that you can anticipate that human price, but uh, it's often not possible. You could make the same argument for the mRNA vaccines as a very rare cause of, you know, uh, myocarditis inflammation of the heart muscle, which is fortunately transient and self-limited. That really isn't the case with the Johnson & Johnson, which can be associated with fatalities, although again, very rare. I mean, you're talking about sort of one to two per million people, so extremely rare, but real. And if you have an alternative vaccine as we do with the mRNA vaccines, that becomes the preferential vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine would only be used if you have no other way of getting an mRNA vaccine. So what do you say to skeptics who might hear that and think, see, that's why I want to wait to get vaccinated? No, I think it makes sense. I mean, the father of modern vaccines was a man named Maurice Hilleman. He did the primary research or development of nine of the 14 vaccines we currently give to children today. Um, he said it best. He said, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. I can understand the hesitancy at the beginning, but now you have billions of people who've been vaccinated. I think everything you need to know about this vaccine, you now know. So I think the hesitancy doesn't make sense at this point. Now, you talked about the speed with which these vaccines were uh, developed. I know Pfizer and Moderna use messenger RNA, which works a little bit differently than some previous vaccines. Can you walk us through that and why that helped be such a game changer for vaccine technology? Right. Normally, you know, when you when you give a vaccine, you're trying to make an immune response to a particular protein. In this case, the spike protein, you give the protein in some form, whole killed virus or just give the actual purified protein. Here, you actually give the gene that makes the protein, which was different. And so we're, we, we've learned a lot about this technology and it may be a value for other uh, problems as well. All right. Dr. Paul Offit, we appreciate your time today and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.